Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, our Kaleidoscope webinar, all about learning healthcare systems uh, with uh, the fantastic Don Goldman. Don, you're joining us from Boston shortly to go to Chicago, snow dependent, is that right? Well, no, I'm going to get there. The question is, will I get back? And, and I do have here in honor of you a cup of tea, but I notice it's extremely large and not very British. And it's you don't drink huge mugs of tea like this, do you? <laughs> Don, we appreciate the effort. Don, thank you for watching. Uh, my name's Rich Todd. I'm Anna Howells. Uh, and we're here, part of Kaleidoscope. Um, and over the next uh, 58 minutes or so, I think we're going to have uh, a great presentation from Don, uh, but also a great discussion around learning healthcare systems. And if you're, if you're sitting there scratching your head going, what I know healthcare needs more than anything else is a new three-letter acronym uh, describing a concept which may or may not mean something or everything, um, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you. Um, yeah, and it will be transformative for sure. <laughs> It'll be transformative. It may even be the, the panacea to end all our ills. Uh, we will see as we go through. Uh, but we talk a lot in healthcare about concepts which are which are coming to the table. Uh, and we do often give them a three-letter acronym. Uh, and so I, I think that the starting point for this discussion is when we talk about learning healthcare systems, are we talking about something which is which we all should pay attention to, and particularly should clinicians pay attention to it, uh, or is it another one to, to let go by and we'll just carry on with our, our day job? And fantastic that we've got Don with us to talk through that topic. Uh, and we'll come to uh, Don's presentation in just one second. Uh, but at the heart of this is a discussion and we'd love for you to join in. Anna, how can people get involved? Yeah, there's three ways you can join the conversation today. You can um, use the question box facility on your screens and um, you can email us hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or you can join the conversation on twitter using hashtag kscope lhs Anna, thank you very much indeed so please do send to uh comments questions uh, uh head scratching puzzlement as we go through really welcome that and um, just to say again so we are kaleidoscope health and care so strength five brings people together to improve health and care. Uh, and we try and do this by finding new ways to overcome old barriers. Uh, running webinars such as this is one of the key ways which we do that. And so joined today by myself and Anna. Uh, and it's wonderful that uh, Don has agreed to be one of our senior associates here at, at Kaleidoscope. Uh, and, on, and on that note, Don, your, your resume is not small. Um, but I, I think when you come to reflect on your career, being a senior associate at Kaleidoscope, it's probably going to be the, it's the cherry on the top of the cake. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry there was no room for it on the slide. And the, <laughs> the, only, reason, the only reason I show these uh, titles is to impress upon people that you can, in fact, advance academically by doing good uh, improvement science. So uh, it's not putting up there to puff out my chest. It's just to say that if you really do quality improvement well, it can be uh, uh, recognized academically. Don, thanks. Uh, Don, uh, over to you. Engaging clinicians in the learning healthcare system. Yeah, and you're going to flip the slides here, right? So if I say next, you'll just go to next, right? Just like that, yeah. Yeah, good. Well, let's go to next and we'll get started. So uh, the National Academy of Medicine in the United States is a, uh, a sort of government appointed independent group that really tries to exhaustively look at important developments in health and healthcare and in other fields as well. And they spent a lot of time thinking about the learning healthcare system. And I've given two definitions here. Uh, which I'm not going to just uh, read out to you, but you'll see that they're very all-inclusive. They're kind of omnibus uh, definitions. I prefer the second one uh, to the first because it specifically calls out the patient uh, that we're really trying to learn uh, and drive better health care on behalf of the patients uh, we serve. And there are a lot of publications. If you just Google this online, you'll come up with all kinds of uh, stuff. Um, there is a Center for Research and Learning Health System in Newcastle, I believe, uh, in England. Uh, and now there is a journal, Learning Health Systems Journal. Well, one of the sure signs that a term is gaining traction is when people call themselves the professor of such and such learning health systems or set up a center 
for learning health systems or start a journal and a society. Uh, and then what do you know, they're world famous for being the, the expert on learning health systems. So uh, I, I don't advocate for that, but that seems to be where we're going with this uh, term. So next, please. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of different broad definitions or conceptual models about what a learning healthcare system is, and it's created quite a bit of confusion. I, I've uh, I, on the next couple of slides, I'll show you uh, some of these, uh, and they really are quite different. I, I will say that they all uh, rely on a large degree of trust that the information, the data that's being shared, is being shared amongst people who are trustworthy and aren't going to abuse the privilege. And as we're reading in the news just today, it's easy to take big data and use it for unworthy uh, causes, uh, as you're seeing with Cambridge Analytics, Analytica and their uh, problems with Facebook data. So this issue of using big data does require a certain amount of vigilance and trust. Uh, I do make a distinction between what most people call big data in healthcare and real big data. Most healthcare data that I see are actually clinical data sets that are not big data. They don't include information about what people buy as consumers, how many bandages they've bought at Boots, uh, where they uh, go online to look for things. That, that, that's big data. It uses all the data that can be captured from the world of the internet and other sources. Clinical data are usually restricted to what can be gathered from electronic medical record or from national uh, registries uh, of various uh, healthcare specialties and so forth. Um, the idea is to yield insights that are more timely and population based than what we usually see in health services research or even in clinical trials where the data are generally restricted. Uh, somebody set up a, a data source and now we're going to uh, dig into it or we're going to do a clinical trial in a limited population. Uh, the Probably the most uh, important national data set in the United States, and I'm sure you have equivalent in NHS, is, is PCORnet. The, this is the National Patient Center Clinical Research Network uh, based out of the PCORI, which is the uh, Clinical Outcomes Research Group in the United States. And I've given you a citation there, and uh, they're starting to use that data. There's always this enormous lag between setting up a framework to collect the data and actually use it for something valuable. Uh, one uh, network that really did use this data well is the Health Systems Research Network. This was made up of integrated health systems, which we called HMOs at, at the time. Uh, and uh, just speaking from my own pediatric perspective, some really good studies were done using that data to look at uh, harms associated with giving uh, drugs in pediatric uh, patients. One of the most promising uh, aspects of having these large data uh, sets available is the ability to do what are called large simple trials. Uh, now, if you want to do a randomized control trial for, let's say, uh, a drug or for a type of intervention that you're trying to do in, to improve care, uh, you have a multi-year process. It's extremely expensive. It's often three to five years before you get a result. Large simple trials take all the data that's available, which in general, uh, if you're really using big data, is more representative of the entire population. And it uses statistical ways to actually look uh, at what's happening in people who do or don't take a drug or people who are or are not exposed to an intervention. And it's a little bit more quick and dirty. It's not quite as well controlled as a traditional randomized control trial. But I think it's going to be much more uh, agile, much cheaper, and, and much more responsive to what we need to learn about. Uh, the next bullet uh, talks about using these large data sets to detect uh, signals uh, of harm from pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and devices. And in the United States, the most important is an FDA, Food and Drug Administration, Sentinel Initiative, which, for example, right now is looking to see how often new statins and ACE inhibitors uh, are associated with melting of the muscles or rhabdomyolysis, which is an important side effect. Now, again, as a pediatrician, one of the pilots uh, for this uh, Sentinel system looked at rotavirus vaccine, a vaccine against uh, viral diarrhea that's a major problem worldwide. And this new vaccine was looking really, really good, but there was a suspicion that it caused the intestine to 
uh, invaginated upon itself. It's called intussusception. Uh, and they were able to show relatively quickly that this was a side effect and to quantitate exactly what a, uh, how big that risk was. So this is all very promising. Some of you may, may remember uh, when we were looking at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents uh, a while ago, uh, both the NHS uh, data sets and data from uh, Scandinavia, which has excellent uh, clinical uh, data, and from Kaiser Permanente in the U.S., showed that a specific uh, agent was associated with severe uh, heart disease and death. And within uh, weeks of those data becoming available, uh, the drug was no longer uh, used uh, as an anti-inflammatory in the NHS and in Kaiser Permanente. So a good example of the rapid use of large data and learning quickly from those data. So if you look at the next slide, we'll see some other kinds of uh, models. Uh, some people think that the uh, way in which we learn and have a learning healthcare system is to use our uh, clinical uh, healthcare systems uh, to run actual uh, clinical trials. And in the U.S., and uh, this is a pretty well-known example, the Hospital Corporation of America, which has uh, scores of hospitals around the country, uh, decided to test a uh, idea that came from some of my colleagues in infection control. Uh, namely, if you uh, wash uh, people in intensive care units, especially with chlorhexidine and antiseptic, uh, you can prevent the uh, spread of methicillin-resistant staph aureus or MRSA from patient to patient and avoid infections. And this actually was highly effective, this reduced MRSA clinical trial. And as a result, uh, HCA, Hospital Corporation of America, spread it throughout its entire system and published uh, the results of how they did that. So it's a really good example of how a healthcare delivery system, which wants to learn rapidly in a rigorous way, can actually do randomized controlled trials. Uh, another way to learn and have a learning healthcare system is to run formal uh, learning collaboratives where we share learning about implementation and spread and scale up uh, of evidence-based practices. Uh, one of the most successful in the U.S. is the Children's uh, Hospital Solutions for Patient Safety. Uh, I, I think that it now has most of the major freestanding children's hospitals in the United States, and they've taken on a dozen or so, maybe 20 now, uh, clinical issues where they're trying together to learn how to best implement these practices to make care safer and uh, more effective. Um, I'm involved in a collaborative with our uh, Commonwealth Fund in the United States which has harvested some really innovative ideas from other developed economies. In fact, three of them are uh, from uh, the UK. Uh, one of them, for example, uh, being flip discharge, another one being experience-based co-design. Uh, and uh, US healthcare systems went over to visit and uh, do site visits of these programs. And now as a group of 13 healthcare systems are trying to test and see how they can adapt these uh, innovations, if you will, uh, in the United States. So that's a type of learning collaborative. Uh, probably the most famous, in which you try to replicate in uh, NHS, is the Keystone Project in Michigan. Uh, this was run by a guy from Hopkins named Peter Pronovost, designed to reduce central line associated bloodstream infections in 103 uh, ITUs. And uh, they showed that they could do that in a learning collaborative where they implemented evidence-based practices very well. Uh, you tried to replicate that um, in, in uh, something, I think it was called, uh, not copying Michigan, but some phrase like that. And it <clears throat> failed miserably. Uh, and Mary Dixon Woods, who's at Cambridge, um, did some analysis of why this was the case. And it turns out that uh, understanding what uh, the context is in which you're trying to duplicate uh, an experience is really important and um, doing it with great fidelity is very important. And so just plopping it down in the middle of the NHS didn't really work very well. Then some organizations think of learning healthcare systems as what they can do internally to learn. So uh, let's say, for example, that Boston Children's Hospital, where I, want, where I work, wants to introduce a way to 
uh, look at reconciling medications patients are on so that we're absolutely sure they're getting the right medications and that they're delivered reliably. Um, well, we might have the various service lines and, and, and wards uh, in the hospital function as a learning collaborative in which they learn from each other uh, how they can uh, do this in the best possible way, given the fact that one of them's in cardiology and one of them's in surgery. Uh, so this is mutual learning, learning healthcare system where people are exchanging uh, information. Uh, now, uh, if the next slide can come up, I wanna give a caveat. I think that's what the next slide is. And that's a lot of people, uh, including our own uh, federal government, uh, keep asking us and, and putting money out there to do learning collaboratives. And they almost always show this. This is a uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement model for what's called a breakthrough series collaborative. We've been doing that now for, I would say, 20 years, uh, in which you have something you want to implement, you bring everybody together, you have some learning, then you go off and you try stuff and come back and have more learning. And this is all coached through a series of cycles in the hope that you will successfully implement and spread uh, best practices. That's great if you have evidence-based uh, practices that everybody agrees are relatively simple to implement. Uh, if, however, you want to have a collaborative around, let's say, the vanguards, uh, or what are you calling now ICS, your integrated care systems that are supposed to be ACO-like, or you want to have the the Devo Manchester project and the 43 clones of that that are trying to go on. If you want them all to learn together, that's innovation. There is no clear set of specific evidence-based practices that are going to be easy to implement by the organization or at the front line. This kind of model that you have in front of you really doesn't work very, very well for that. You have to have a much more flexible willingness to learn, to adapt, to change what the uh, model actually looks like as you go, different ways to measure whether or not you're testing and getting some traction. So just don't think that you can take this breakthrough series collaborative model and use it for all purposes. The learning system, regardless of which type you choose, uh, has to be fit for purpose. Next, please. Don, just to be clear that our integrated care systems are very, very different to ACOs. This was not just a, a rebranding. There's some fundamental differences, which we're still to work out what they are, but they're very fundamental, whatever they are. Yeah, so I've been told. I was just told this yesterday, but it's, it's always very hard, frankly, to keep up with all of the experiments, the pioneers, the vanguards, the what are the what are the 43 Devo type things called? That's something different. Oh, and then you had we, we lead the world in coming up with terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really quite something. I had a Harkness fellow uh, explain to me on a, on a very large sheet of paper how all this fits together. And uh, I concluded that uh, the only way to understand it was to come and spend a year or two with you. And, uh, that invite hasn't come across yet, but I'm sure it will. Uh, so uh, here's one of my big professional goals, engaging clinicians uh, in improvement science and learning. And this seems very hard most of the time. And now, on the next slide, uh, you'll see why this is, and I'm going to go through these very briefly. Uh, even though we say we're all about improvement, we're really about old style punitive QA a lot of the time. So quality assurance, uh, the NHS is a, is is really aces at this. I mean, you guys really know how to inspect people and uh, punish them if they're not up to uh, standard. And we do the same thing in the U.S. with a lot of pay for performance type of program. So it's hard for me to argue that it's all about just improving and learning uh, when people are being paid or not paid or punished or not punished based on performance. Uh, we tend to talk too much about kind of the religious aspects of quality improvement. We talk a lot about Toyota and the, you know, the, the kind of uh, almost mystical way in which uh, you have to imbibe the quality improvement and uh, use certain terminology. And, and that doesn't go over well, for example, uh, we use the term profound knowledge, which comes from Edwards Deming, one of the great uh, founders of, uh, of quality improvement and improvement science. But when I go up to my clinician colleagues and say I'm going to teach you profound science, uh, the profound knowledge uh, that's seen as arrogant and off-putting. Uh, we tend to focus on non-clinical processes and outcomes. A urologist who does prostate surgery may uh, actually care about waiting times in the clinic but more likely he or she 
cares about whether the patient with cancer uh, in the prostate has the cancer extirpated, whether they're going to be able to have sex, and whether they're going to leak urine or not. So if you don't relate to clinicians about things that matter clinically to them, you're not going to get very far. Uh, we often try and do QI by the book. We're all going to sit down at noon and make a process flow diagram. It's going to take three hours, but it's really, really important. Uh, I've learned that if I want to do that, I go to the operating theater at five in the morning and have cold uh, coffee with the surgeons and find out what they think the process is. And then I translate that rather than asking them to be part of some process they can't possibly do. Um, we're not upfront about the fiscal agenda. We always say or tend to say quality is free, quality is not free. Uh, there's a, still a pretty good sense that if you really improve quality a lot and improve efficiency, in the end, you save money. But in the meanwhile, it takes time, resource, and money to do the, this work. And it, it's hard for people actually at the front line to see the future over the horizon, especially since their leaders have a one-year fiscal time frame. I know in the NHS, with the rapid turnover of chief execs, it's in part because the uh, time horizon and the pressure to perform is so great. Uh, we don't tend to provide clinicians with the data they need to improve. Uh, uh, I don't know what it's like there on an everyday basis, but well, yes, I do. I, I know that at Great Ormond Street, for example, there was no electronic medical record for a while and getting data that was relevant to the improvement teams were trying to do was really hard. And I'm sure that's true in a lot of uh, settings in the NHS. Uh, and we don't emphasize the academic potential. And that's why I showed that first slide to say, if you do it well, you can actually get promoted on this, uh, in this field. Next, please. But other than that, we did pretty well. Uh, so, uh, one thing we don't want to do is confuse you with a lot of terms, and th this slide shows all the different terms that are being used for what's basically the same thing in improvement science, and, and I just think it's scientific improvement using whatever scientific methods uh, and experimental methods we have available to us, and I urge you do not get distracted because some uh, somebody in uh, Oxford or in, in UCLP uh, wants to use their terminology for implementation science or healthcare delivery science. It's all fundamentally comes from the same roots uh, and just called scientific improvement. It's much more appealing, at least to me. Next. So, uh, you know, if we're going to learn, we have to be able to see. Uh, you know, I think that observing uh, is really important and uh, it's not just data. Uh, if we really want to understand, it's really mixed methods. It's data, quantitative methods and qualitative methods, which is based on careful observation of the uh, context the setting in which we're doing our work. And so if we go to the next, um, we're not actually teaching clinical people to observe. And I've put some data up here from the US on how little time junior doctors in the US actually spend at the bedside observing, talking to, learning from patients or spending with their teams learning uh, about what works and what doesn't work. And th this is toxic and I think it's creating a generation of trainees who actually aren't going to be skilled observers and therefore won't learn in a holistic way about uh, what it is they're, uh, they're trying to do. Next, please. So let's uh, let's look at some cathedrals, uh, and and I want to see just show you how innovation and observation work in uh, church architecture. So we're going to go through these pretty quickly because we don't have all that much time today. Uh, and let's uh, look at a couple of churches, please. So this is a Carolingian church uh, from 824 to 827. It's solid, sturdy, not very exciting architecturally. There's only one window of any size, and that's a new one that you see there. It was clearly put in later. Uh, so these were dark, gloomy places where you uh, uh, were free to be uh, looking within and, and thinking about uh, the Lord. Next. Uh, however, uh, innovations began to occur. This is uh, now getting to 900 and beyond. Uh, this is church in Rachenau, and you'll see here, if you're observing carefully, that this church is taller. And one of the reasons for this is they learned about buttressing the walls. 
uh, church, churches, as they get taller, the walls tend to fall outwards and they collapse, killing the workmen. Um, you learn very quickly in your plan to study act cycles and your experiments, if a large church wall falls on you, that that's not a good design. And gradually you'll see here uh, buttresses uh, in both the uh, side uh, aisles there is buttressing the center. And then there are little buttresses holding up the side aisle. Uh, next, please. And this can get quite uh, elegant, uh, just following these general uh, forms. And this is a, uh, a slightly later uh, church and abbey in Normandy. Next. We're now getting into the Romanesque era, and it was uh, realized that uh, a arch uh, is a strong structural component. If you go all the way back to Mycenae and in the Peloponnesus, I think it is in Greece, you'll find that those ancient structures and walls used a lot of these arches and, and they are stronger and allow you to build more impressive uh, buildings like uh, this one. So a major innovation, again, a lot of trial error, a lot of what we would say quality improvement, observing, testing, trying, having the church fall on you, spending another 10 years to get it to rebuilt to where it was next. And of course, this is a major advance. This is a, if you look at this and you know much about church architecture at all, you'll notice the flying buttresses. What a clever way to hold up the walls. These are not only elegant, uh, but because they arch out away from the wall, they can carry a lot of uh, strength uh, to hold those walls up. And as a result, you get a taller church and you have a lot more room for windows. So the large rose window, the fabulous, uh, uh, stained glass windows and chart, you know, their cathedrals are all based on this innovation of, again, trial and error. And what's interesting about the Gothic uh, uh, wave is that it spread really, really rapidly. As I remember, it started in Saint-Denis and then it spread throughout Europe in various adaptations for local taste and culture, but a huge breakthrough in innovation. Again, um, knowing how to observe what worked and what didn't work and what was aesthetically pleasing and what pleased the Lord, frankly, uh, was very important. Next. Uh, this is the Salzburg Cathedral. Those of you read uh, Ken Follett's uh, Pillars of uh, Fire, I think it's called, will know that this is the cathedral he was talking about. This is the uh, perpendicular Gothic architecture that's well known in England, very, very elegant. And what's amazing is as they learned and learned and learned, they got faster and faster. This church was built in 38 years, which is a remarkably short period of time for such a massive uh, undertaking. Um, I, I like to tell people that the bridge across the Charles River at Harvard has been going on now for four years, and that's just a renovation of an existing bridge because they want to get it exactly right. So uh, a major achievement. Next. Uh, however, many uh, innovations run their course and end up uh, going to excess. And we see this in healthcare where some uh, model looks really appealing and people start replicating it before you know it. They think it can solve all problems and uh, um, it, it's going to be the answer to their uh, healthcare transformation. This is uh, Amiens and you see flying buttresses upon flying buttresses, an extremely tall church, except it wasn't stable and it's now supported by iron rods and other contraptions to prevent it from falling down. So uh, this is like the excesses of Baroque art where it just got so detailed and ornate that nobody wanted to look at it. Next. So importantly, these are these are really different churches. This one, and you can show the next one as well. Uh, th these these uh, churches don't look anything like those other churches and they're not the product of close observation innovation. They're the product of computer science. So. Uh, these could not have been designed without computer models of tensile strengths and materials and what could hold what, how much glass you could put into it. And, and they were built that way. Uh, sometimes there's spectacular failures. I mean, the bridge just fell down. You may have read about in Florida was a, a computer marvel, except it collapsed and killed people. So you have to be a little bit careful. And of course, if you look at these churches, they're, they're awesome, they're really inspiring, but they, they lack in detail. So if you see the next slide, what, what's been lost in this transformation is this wonderful minute detail. Here you see carving of a Romanesque uh, capital with serpents kind of intertwined. Uh, the next one will show you, I think, Michael weighing the souls uh, at Autun, a Romanesque church. And the next one you see that some souls are going to heaven, some of them are going down to, uh, to hell. Uh, and these were the kind of details that told the story, that told the narrative uh, of faith 
while also entertaining the people who were in the church. And so sometimes stuff is here that's a little bit kind of off color. And you go, what are they doing with that? That looks a little bit too actually sexual or what are all these beasts and animals? The, the idea here is that when you tell your story, you have to not only tell the story of Christ, but you have to entertain people who are sitting on cold, hard benches for uh, most of the day. Uh, so that's the kind of detail I fear is being lost uh, and, the, and the training our eyes to observe and learn when we move from uh, early cathedrals where it's a constant observation, trial, error, build, try, error, error build, uh, to a uh, uh, junior doctor sitting at a computer doing data analytics and, and figuring they now know their patients and know the healthcare system. Next. Uh, when we do observe, we have to be aware of entrenched mental models when we're observing because we tend to think that, uh, based on our recent experience especially, that we know what it is we're seeing and we lose vigilance, if you will. So this is uh, something from The Little Prince, which I hope you've all met, uh, where uh, he, this you know, child shows a masterpiece to grown-ups and says, does this drawing frighten you? And they say, no, why would a, a hat frighten me? But of course, it's a blanket covering an elephant. Uh, so always check your mental models and observe carefully. And on the next slide, one of my favorite uh, tattoos, uh, which I truly uh, do believe they're great truths within you and in your patients and in your organizations, if you just take uh, the bother to look. So next. So uh, how we know and learn and you know, my team there, Kaleidoscope, it, it's obvious to me that I'm not going to be able to go into detail on a couple of these slides. And so the folks out there, I'm just going to tell you what these slides show, and then you can study them in detail rather than me uh, giving my lecture about them. But let's go to the next slide. This is a very complicated looking slide from a guy named uh, uh, Clay Christensen is one of the great innovators of our time. He found that this whole idea of disruptive innovation, and uh, you can read about that if you Google him. But what I liked about this was he, he basically showed how we classify what we see and what we observe into a theory, and that's on the left side, the descriptive theory. Uh, and we gain confidence in that as we continue to classify, observe, and analyze. Uh, until the point is we have a theory for change that's so strong that we wanna go test it in the field as a, let's say, a clinical trial. And he calls that normative theory. It's basically field testing of our theory to see if it works. And you do iterative testing and clinical trials until you're really sure this is something that should be scaled up and it will change care uh, for uh, people, let's say, uh, in the NHS who have high blood pressure. Uh, the most important thing I want you to notice here is the red. He is doing exactly what quality improvers are doing. He has a theory, a prediction, and he's doing tests and gradually confirming or not confirming what he thinks he's seen. So predict and confirm. That is the essence of quality improvement in the plan, do, study, act cycle. We have a prediction. We plan a study. We analyze what we found. We either confirm it or we don't, and we adjust what we do based on that. He also has these large red blobs that say anomaly. He is constantly, constantly looking for anomalies, those things that tend to disprove what we're so sure of. Now, when we do observational studies and publish them in the Lancet or the BMJ, very rarely do people call out the anomalies that actually challenge their theory. What they do is they adjust for them statistically so they go away. They say, we adjusted for X, Y, and Z. They went away. Here's the conclusion. Christensen and myself would say, let's study those anomalies. Why did that actually seem to tell us a different story than what we ended up concluding? And even in randomized trials where we have, let's say, 30 or 40 or 50 centers and thousands of patients participating, again, we adjust away statistically all of the differences that somehow don't line up uh, with what most of the patients seem to be telling us, and we fail to learn when we do that. So study this in some depth. It's really quite a profound observation. Next, please. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, we probably won't go through all the detail here, clinical pathways are a great way to engage clinicians in both evidence-based care and in ongoing continuous learning. So let's uh, look at the next slide. 
Uh, so what is an honest clinical pathway? It tells us what we do and don't know. Most pathways, let's say for the treatment of diabetes, uh, at diabetic ketoacidosis in the hospital, or for cardiac surgery, or for hip and knee replace, uh, arthroplasty, uh, they contain a number of components that are evidence-based and we're really quite sure about, but numerous parts that we are basing on opinion or consensus where the evidence is really incomplete. Uh, and we want to understand where we know so much, we are so sure that we want strong adherence to those elements of the pathway, but to call out where we're not so sure we want clinicians to use their judgment and if they think prudent, deviate from the pathway. This allows us to learn from those experienced clinicians who have seen anomalies, something that disturbs them about the clinical pathway we put out there that they think we ought to change and maybe learn from. Next slide. Uh, this is something I want you to study on your own, if you would, please. This is Richard Bomer, one of the most brilliant folks uh, in organizational change. And uh, he simply points out that we have a range of knowledge about almost everything in healthcare ranging from complete ignorance, which is stage one, uh, and this would be diabetes, where people had sweet urine, people used to taste the urine, and then people wasted away and died. And that's all we knew, we knew nothing about it. To complete knowledge, uh, down there, uh, number eight, where we know all the factors that interact to uh, affect a patient with diabetes, make them sick or make them well. And we can actually have artificial pancreas or transplantation or ways to totally make this uh, uh, something we can capture, understand, and act upon. Uh, so simple, in fact, that diabetes care in general uh, can be left to the patient because the rules, the evidence is so clear that doctors really don't have, have to get involved 99% of the time in the care of diabetes these days. Next, next slide. So what's in a clinical pathway? Uh, first of all, it specifies a relatively homogeneous population. This is a uh, 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 helpful, but it's also a bit of a curse because very few patients uh, whom I know are homogeneous. They have multiple diseases, morbidities, and so forth. And saying that uh, finding patients that are all alike means you've taken only a minority of the patients you need to care for. But clinical pathways have to have a relatively homogeneous population, let's say with simple diabetes or simple hip, hip replacement. Uh, then you do an evidence review, uh, and where evidence uh, is solid, you determine that by doing formal evidence grading and the, uh, the Cochrane collaboration, which many of you have heard of. Uh, that's what they do for a living, and so you can usually find where the evidence is strong. There are clear boundaries in place and time. Where is this pathway starting? So in hip replacement, it ought to start where the patient comes to the doctor saying, I have pain in my hip and a decision is going to be made whether or not to do surgery. And it ends far enough after the surgery so that the patient reported outcomes, their functional status, their pain level, what they can do, uh, can be actually assessed uh, outside of the immediate operative period. There's a process map that shows this entire pathway. Those of you who aren't familiar with uh, process flow diagrams, you just Google it and you'll see simple ones will come right up for you. But what I like to see is not just one pathway. I like to see a pathway with swim lanes, like in, a, in an Olympic pool. Each swimmer has their own lane. The uh, physiotherapist, the nurse, the social worker, the surgeon, the, the consultant, they all have their own swim lane and where they interact with the patient is specified on that process flow map. And of course you need a measurement framework to, turn, to determine whether those key steps in the pathway are being followed or not and whether the outcomes you want to achieve are actually being achieved. So next. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to doing pathways, a lot of work to create them. They only cover a fraction of all the things you need to work on in a, in a healthcare system. It's very time consuming to analyze them and revise them. Uh, most electronic medical records aren't designed to support this. They were designed for purposes of charging and billing and, and, and uh, capturing data about efficiency. Uh, and if there are ambiguities in the evidence, uh, hopefully you can get some learning from clinicians who uh, practice in different ways and you study what they did, but it's really pretty hard to resolve ambiguities in evidence uh, without a more formal way of doing it. Next. 
Next, please. Um, so uh, when you're doing a pathway, clear, clearly indicate to whom it does and doesn't apply and be careful about frail elders with uh, 12 morbidities and 22 medications. Uh, incorporate checklists. Checklists are really powerful. I'm sure many of you have read the checklist manifesto from Atul Gawande and you know that Peter Pronovos used a checklist in his Keystone project. They're, they're really helpful but they're, they operate at specific points in that overall clinical pathway and system and building them in. So you say, this is where you need to use the checklist is really helpful in driving what you do and in collecting the data. The checklist itself is a data collection tool. Build in checkpoints. So in giving antibiotics and the antibiotic stewardship movement now, there's an antibiotic timeout. You start at your antibiotics, uh, 72 or 48 hours have gone by, the culture's available, take a time out. This is the time to say, we should be stopping them here unless we have evidence to continue. So those kind of checkpoints are really important and really important are standardized order sets. When we order tests, uh, pharmaceuticals in clinical care, having a standardized order set that makes the best practice the default and forces the prescriber to say, well, I'm not gonna do it that way and here's why can be a very, very powerful learning tool and also drive better behavior. It's part of uh, behavioral science, actually, and systems engineering to kind of nudge people to do what you think is uh, evidence-based, but allow them always to opt out next. Uh, and this is the important point. Do allow them to opt out, uh, but require physicians to document why they're deviating the pathways so you can have, in fact, a learning healthcare system. And I've never seen, and I've done some expert witnessing in uh, medical malpractice, I've never seen a physician successfully sued if he or she recorded in the medical record why they deviated from so-called standard care. Uh, be skeptical if uh, a given physician is constantly deviating from something that's uh, explicit, rules-based, evidence-based care, but be extremely permissive and learn when we really don't know the best practice and we want to take advantage of the clinician's tacit knowledge uh, and just be realistic about what it takes to maintain these. I think that may be coming to the end. Can we just check to see what the next slide is? Ah, yes. Uh, uh, there's an example that follows this in the slide set you're going to have access to of how to embed quality measurement in the clinical pathways and into routine work so that you can immediately see how you're doing. So the data is visible and is fed back right away uh, to the uh, care team. If somebody says to you, well, we can't collect that data as part of routine care, given the way we provide care, challenge them and say, well, maybe your system needs to be redesigned so that you can actually capture the data you need to provide optimal care while you're giving the care. If they, if they say we need to hire a nurse, forget it. Nurses are really valuable commodities. They shouldn't be commodity, bad words. Sorry, all the nurses out there, you are not commodities. You're very talented individuals who are absolutely critical to care. Sorry about that. Uh, but they, but you're valuable and we don't want you uh, sitting around with a notepad, uh, keeping track of measures on clinical care that should be part of the routine care. Always think about balancing measures, right? You may have the best idea in the world. And for example, you want 100% adherence or compliance to isolation precautions for patients who have MRSA or methicillin resistant staph. You've had a huge problem in the past in the NHS with that. You want people to be put on precautions. That's great. Except when you do that, be aware that they're going to be stigmatized. Uh, at least they may feel that way. Uh, we know that caregivers don't go in the room as often because they have to gown and glove and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, that can be really uh, uh, counter uh, to doing the best possible care. And by the way, gowns, gloves cost money and it takes, uh, I've seen data, uh, 17 to 27 seconds to put on that stuff, which is a large amount of time if you've got 20 patients on precautions in an ITU. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, and you can look at the example of a patient safety uh, project that we did in which uh, we embedded uh, measurement and learning right in care and ended up with a published paper and everybody was happy, including the patients and families. Uh, Don, thank you very much indeed. A, a masterclass.
um, uh, in learning uh, in, in a little over 40 minutes. So, Don, thank you very much indeed. Um, if you uh, if you fell asleep in the middle of that, and I don't know why you would, and suddenly woke up to see pictures of uh, French abbeys, that did happen. That did happen. <laughs> uh, learning church care systems with Don Goldman in all good retailers shortly. Um, I spared I spared you the plague bubonic plague art that was originally in the talk, and I just figured I didn't have time. <laughs> well, we've done it on the next one, Tom. That's great. Uh, so I think we've got about a quarter of an hour for questions, discussions. We'd love for your input. Anna, how do things get involved? Yeah, three ways to join the conversation, and thanks to those who have sent through so far. Um, they use the um, ask question feature on your screens in front of you. You can email hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare, or you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag um, kscope LHS. Lovely, Anna, thank you very much. Uh, and I think we'll come straight to the question in one sure. moment. But just to go back to our point on about jargon, and very quickly, what I, what I take as being the sort of the bedrock of learning healthcare systems is about how you can be learning quickly in rigorous ways. Is, is that sort of the, the fundamental nature of this as you see it? Yeah, as long as rigorous doesn't imply that you've got to do randomized control trials or that it's entirely quantitative. There, there is rigor in doing qualitative inquiry. And I'll just make a quick uh, editorial comment here. When I say qualitative, a lot of people who are qualitative researchers or social scientists uh, think that this is a really big deal. And many of my fellows who've done qualitative inquiry in healthcare have taken three years to do key informant interviews and focus groups, and then they code stuff and they derive themes from computer programs. And it takes them a year to write up the paper, which is in general, very hard to get published. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about deductive quality, uh, qualitative uh, inquiry or ethnographic inquiry where you go in with a theory and you have some more pointed uh, questions and observations you're planning to make. And, and sometimes this can be done through video ethnography. I mean, a simple handheld camera or cell phone can tell you more about what's really going on than some long thematic analysis. So learning quickly in vigorous ways, open brackets, not too vigorous, close brackets. And there we go. I'm, uh, Dom, let's let's go straight on to questions. Anna. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you for sending your questions through all. Um, the first question we have is from David, who asks, um, what can we do to encourage observation skills? But I think a little bit linked to that, we have um, a question from Sam, who asks, um, how can we foster an interesting QI for students and trainee doctors, given that it's often, that it isn't often seen um, as high, seen as highly as research? Um, it's tough to build capacity without building a strong workforce. So any resources you can recommend? Yeah, so these are both, uh, they're kind of related, but at the same time, they're a little different. So in terms of how you train people to observe, you know, one of the uh, interesting developments, at least in the US, has been, uh, I'm trying to remember the official name for this, but it basically is uh, using the arts to train uh, clinicians how to observe. and. Uh, there are now uh, people in courses uh, who will take medical students, for example, to museums and teach them how to see. Uh, I, I teach a course at, in college in general education on uh, the impact of infectious diseases on history and society. And the most popular part of that course is the art I show. And I, I generally just take a very a kind of a Socratic way of doing this to say, you know, what do you see? What are you learning from this? And it's amazing that people tend to go to paintings looking for whatever they've been told they should look for. So look at the pelican uh, pecking at its own breast. That means Christ or whatever. And that's, they see that, but they don't get the experience of what they're really looking at. So I think that we need to retrain uh, young people, be they nurses, physicians, whatever, and just how to see with an open mind uh, and not just to look for what they were trained to look for. Uh, in terms of engaging people, when, uh, especially young people, when their organization doesn't value uh, that kind of learning, uh, especially academically. So there are two answers, one leave, 
uh, and go to an organization where it is valued. And uh, increasingly, I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm only half kidding. I see that my friends are smiling. Uh, but when you're making your career choices, uh, I often advise people to be very transparent about what it is they want to do and to be uh, interviewers, not just being interviewed when they're going around looking for their placement. Uh, and uh, you'll know in, a, in a, about a minute whether or not it's an organization that really cares about what you do. That said, uh, this is a science and it's not a difficult science. Now you could spend uh, the better part of a year trying to become facile in improvement science the way you would with epidemiology or anything else. Uh, but the basic fundamentals that you need to do rigorous work can be learned more quickly than that. There's actually uh, a massive open online course or MOOC uh, that we've done at IHI, uh, the, the core faculty with Harvard and Harvard X, uh, that if you go online and just type in Harvard X practical uh, improvement science, it will come up. And that's seven lessons that give the fundamentals of practical improvement science. Uh, they're are guidelines and papers published on how to uh, get your work done in a rigorous way so it can be published academically. I think there is a pathway and uh, I, I can't speak for Ox, Oxcam and so forth, but um, in general, uh, I think there's increasingly a pathway for people who are innovative in this field. Don, thanks very much. And just as a sort of a clarification, that's Harvard single X, no more X's, Harvard X single X. Don, that's right. Yes. Bobby, don't Google Harvard at multiple X's, you might get something else. Um, Don, thanks very much. Um, Anna, how can we, people get involved? One last reminder. Uh, yep, yeah, three ways to get involved, using the uh, question box facility on your screens, um, emailing hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare, or joining the conversation on Twitter, hashtag kscope, um, LHS. And if you're joining live, fantastic. If you're watching this back later on, probably that ask question feature is gonna be less helpful for you, uh, but you're still very welcome to uh, email us your views or to tweet, please do. Uh, just to say, uh, Don mentioned that the slides uh, are available. Indeed, if you, again, if you're watching live, uh, they will be on your little handouts tab on GoToWebinar. Uh, if you're watching if you're watching back, if you get, if you just want to email us, hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare, and we can forward those on to you if you're after a copy of some beautiful medieval churches and some <laughs> fantastic sites as well. Um, quick question, can I jump in with a question? Uh, uh, you may. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Don, going right back to the beginning, um, you talked about how uh, these, these systems only work if you've got trust, and trust being a sort of a fundamental part of that. Um, I, was, I was really intrigued by your, your slide about um, uh, knowledge, the Richard Bomer slide, uh, talking about diabetes. Um, how, how well do you think we know, let me see if I'm really tough, how well do you think you know how to build trust across organisations, professions, uh, um, different groups? It, it seems like this is a question we talk quite a lot about, at how you build trust, but it's not always that people have, have a clear strategy about how to do so. Yeah, you know, there's a woman with whom I've worked, uh, uh, done some excellent work in this area, Jody Hoffer Gattel, that's H O F F E R hyphen G I T T E L L. And she's written on relational coordination. Uh, her material is easy to find. She originally studied Southwest Airline, which was a very successful startup airline in the United States, and how they created a culture uh, of uh, mutual learning and trust. Uh, and she has some very simple paradigms for how you build good relational uh, uh, teams, basically. And you can do this both within your own organization, within your own microsystem or team, uh, and you can do it amongst stakeholders. So, for example, if you were a uh, uh, one of the new, what do you call them? I, you know, I integrated. ICSs, one of the goals there, as I understand it, is to uh, build uh, uh, communications and cooperation between healthcare delivery trusts and communities. And that's not easy to do. So you have to have some way of saying, where are the areas in which we are, uh, in fact, trusting each other, we're relating in a, in a uh, open, transparent way, and where do we have barriers and we're not doing that. And it, it, it's like anything else. There is a scientific basis for this. But um, you know, in one hand, you know it when you see it because everybody's coming and willingly sharing. And 
you know it when it's not happening because people come and they're guarding and holding back. Uh, so uh, there is a, we don't have time to go into all that today. It's, it, it, I've always regarded it as a bit, I'm a scientist, right? So it seems a little softer to me, but it's actually not so soft. There's good uh, sociologic data around this. Uh, uh, the simplest way uh, to, to actually do this, if there's an individual or a team, you can simply draw lines amongst the people on a piece of paper and two solid lines means it's a strong trusting relationship. One line means it's okay. And a dotted line means not so much. Uh, and just, but being explicit about are we a team or not is really important. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll tweet the link to the, uh, the um, article uh, as you voted on that. It looks fascinating. I'm sure people will be really interested uh, Anna, with the closing, coming to a close, uh, any final questions? Um, we do. Uh, a nice, easy question to, to finish with, or not as the case may be. Um, so David uh, asks, um, swim lane processes that you mentioned uh, previously, Zod, um, would normally be mixed clinical and non-clinical interventions. And it's the interactions between these that generate the outcomes. But the standards of evidence for these different kinds of interventions are very different. So how do we iteratively learn in these mixed environments while retaining consensus of our learning network? That's easy, huh? <laughs> That's really funny. You're very funny. <laughs> I'm glad you said or not. Um, I, I think it does get back to being uh, clear about what you're pretty confident about and what you're not and focusing your learning on areas where there may be disagreement or lack of really good evidence so that you can begin to determine whether, uh, at least by the measures you've set up, the measurement framework you've set up, there is uh, progress or not. The, the, the key to me is being very clear about what the attributes or specifications are of your intervention. I remember I went to one trust that's well, quite well known in uh, the NHS, uh, and they had this wonderful innovative model that they said to transform care. Uh, and what uh, kind of surprised me in the way I must say disappointed me was when I said, can you outline the technical specifications, the core attributes that really need to be replicated with fidelity because you found that without them, it just won't work. And which parts of this can people adapt to their own environment? And they had actually hadn't thought about that. And so to me, it wasn't surprising that it hadn't spread because they weren't clear in their own mind about what it was that drove success. Uh, in their organization. So th that's a fuzzy answer. Um, th there's a reason why uh, a model that's developed, let's say at Imperial, uh, isn't necessarily being used in uh, Northumbria uh, be because it's been developed by and for uh, the Imperial and they haven't really, perhaps, I'm not singling them out, but maybe they haven't really specified what it is about that model that Northumbria must uh, think about when they're trying to implement themselves. Um, very few models, for example, in the United States that are designed to care for uh, the patient population that's high risk, high need, uh, patients who are fragile elders and patients with multiple comorbidities or patients with disabilities. Very few of those models have been tested outside of the founding organization. So Massachusetts General Hospital has this model that they're all over talking about. It's great. Everybody cheers and the applause is very loud, uh, but you can't find anybody else who's actually done it. And uh, that, that's kind of fatal to the rapid spread of the model. Sometimes the really simple stuff, uh, the catchy stuff that looks uh, oh so cool, spreads too rapidly and everybody starts adopting it without all those other elements that the questioner brought up. So they've done, uh, X out of the range of 22 things that need to be done, and then they're surprised that uh, surgery isn't safer, for example. Oh, thanks. Uh, and I think uh, clearly echoing, um, people may have read the excellent recent report by the Health Foundation and the Innovation Unit all about uh, scale and spread. Uh, and again, just reinforces that point about, uh, about adaption. Actually, where well, you've got yeah, and there's a great, anybody really wants to see this, uh, the apotheosis of this, you know, there was a study by Tulgawandi and colleagues who was published in New England Journal on the surgical safety checklist that was studied in eight institutions around the world and looked fabulous. Ontario, province of Ontario in Canada, mandated it. 
that every operating theater in the in Ontario always surgical safety checklist. And when they looked at the results, there was no change. Uh, and that's because they didn't do all the other stuff that the Gawande team did when they were working in these eight hospitals. They just said, go do it. Here's a checklist. Good luck. Not the sound is based for success. We are we are pretty much out of time. So what I'm going to ask uh, my uh, fellow colleagues to do is just we're going to do one very quick key reflection from our discussion. Uh, so I'll start just to buy uh, Anna and then Don some time, but we'll be 90 seconds and then we'll and then we'll finish if I'm slightly over. Uh, so again, Don, thank you so much for joining us uh, a real masterclass. Uh, and the key thing which I think I'll I'll hold is just going back to your point, Don, about this is about rigor, but not too much rigor to scare up, mm. and actually how you combine those different techniques, the observation with the data. Uh, there's there's no one single answer here. It is that combination and having the skills to do the combination that really sticks out for me. Hello. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit greedy and say two quick key oh. things. Um, so first, I think um, definitely what Dom was saying, kind of context is key for kind of sharing learning between different organisations or different areas. And then secondly, um, just thought it was really interesting the conversation around. Um, the um, importance of observation as a skill and how this might be being lost in kind of modern medicine. Lovely. Uh, and Don, you have the last word. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that people are listening or hear the subsequent recording will send me uh, pictures of cathedrals uh, <laughs> that can, uh, because I'm sure I've missed some really good examples. So uh, I promise you, if you send me one that uh, will increase people's observational ability and shows innovation, uh, I will use it in my class. <laughs> on on that note, I'm I'm certain now. On that, now you've said that, people probably will do exactly that. So, so no, I don't want any ruins. By the way, I, I don't. I mean, there are a lot of ruined abbeys and stuff. I, I I want the whole thing. I don't want some a few stones lying in a field. Uh, Don, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to send all your cathedral pictures to hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare, uh, or equally, if you'd like to have a conversation with us about learning healthcare systems, how we could potentially support you. Uh, please do get in touch. Don, thank you once again. Anna, You're thank welcome. You. Uh, thank you. And thank you everyone who's been able to join. And we'll see Bye. you again. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.